Welcome to the EndNotes, where we put all the fun facts we can't fit into the main videos. Today, an extra bit of information from the video about what is a recipe, and if you haven't seen that yet, click on the card. We ended that video by talking about the development of women's magazines, and mentioned some of the earliest examples of the genre. So here's a little more info about them, starting with the word magazine itself. It comes originally from the Arabic word makazin, plural of makzan, meaning storehouse. The word came into English through Italian and French in the 16th century with originally the same meaning, particularly a storehouse for military ammunitions. That's why in modern English the word magazine can still be used to refer to the cartridge containing bullets in a gun. It wasn't until the 1731 publication of the Gentleman's Magazine that the word was used to refer to a periodical, basically as a metaphor for a storehouse of information. So this is a nice parallel for apothecary and boutique coming from Greek apotheke, also meaning storehouse. In any case, the original periodicals and magazines were written by men for men, and even when such material expanded to be aimed at a female audience, the publishers and writers were generally men. The original mansplaining, you might say. The first women's magazine, though being first published in 1693, it predates the term magazine, was The Ladies' Mercury, a spin-off from the Athenian Mercury, which had been aimed at both men and women. It was essentially an advice column to which women could send in questions about love, marriage, behavior, clothing, and so forth, and have them answered by what seems to have been an all-male panel, the Athenian Society, run by London author John Dunton and his friends. The Ladies' Mercury ran for only four issues, but it was a start. Several other periodicals aimed at women followed, and by 1770 we come to the Ladies' Magazine. Though still conceived of and published by men, it included female writers and contributors. Indeed, the readership was encouraged to send in their own stories and poems for publication. The content also included society news, but not hard news, which was thought only appropriate for men, fashion, and music. It also included a medical column written by a male doctor, but covering such topics as breastfeeding and menstrual pains. Though earlier magazines were more targeted to upper-class readers, as we come to the 19th century, there were such publications as The English Woman's Domestic Magazine, aimed more at the middle-class wife and mother, with topics such as cookery and fashion, including sewing patterns to replicate the latest looks. But in the 19th century, women's magazines were also becoming more explicitly political. The English Woman's Journal, which started publication in 1858, discussed and promoted issues such as employment and equality for women. Furthermore, it was founded by and employed women. Today, perhaps the quintessential example of the women's magazine, for better or for worse, is Cosmopolitan, mostly known as Cosmo now, which has an interesting history. It went from a general interest family magazine from its inception in 1886 to basically a literary magazine in the early 20th century to a magazine catering to the modern single career woman in 1965 under the direction of editor Helen Gurley Brown, who promoted liberated women's issues. It was in its day a very progressive publication, even if that's hard to imagine now. Along with a number of other magazines that were seen as vehicles of female empowerment and published many important feminist voices in the 60s and 70s, like Chatelaine here in Canada, over the last couple of decades, it has retreated from any overtly political stance and focused on telling women what's wrong with them and how consumerism can fix it. A different kind of recipe for a better life, perhaps. There does, however, seem to be a possible change coming in a newer generation, with magazines such as Teen Vogue taking a more explicitly political stance. As always, you can hear even more etymology and history, as well as interviews with a wide range of fascinating people, on the Endless Knot podcast, available on all the major podcast platforms, as well as on our other YouTube channel. Thanks for watching.